السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي فتاءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد Verily all praise and glory is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It is due to him and another We praise him, we seek his forgiveness and we ask him for his mercy And we testify and we state that there is no God or deity worthy of any type of worship but Allah And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant and final messenger O ye who believe Fear Allah the fear that he is most deserving of you and do not die unless you are in the state of Al-Islam and as to what follows. Before I begin my discussion with you today, I just wish to remind you of our duty as Muslims in upholding the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this reminder is that I do not ever wish to be in the company of Bukhala, of people who are stingy, meaning I do not wish to be in the company of people who when the Prophet وسلم, is mentioned, they don't praise him and send peace and blessings upon him. For this is the sunnah of Rasulullah وسلم, in the authentic hadith he says, the most stingy of mankind is he when I am mentioned, does not say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also in an authentic hadith narrated by Imam al-Hakim, which is authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani hafidahullah, the Prophet ﷺ climbed his minbar as he was about to deliver Salat al-Jumu'ah, a khutbah and upon climbing the first step فَقَلْ عَتَبَةَ الْأُولَى قَالَ آمين. He said, Ameen and then the second step and he said, Ameen and the third step, Ameen and this is something the Sahaba were not accustomed to or used to so after they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why have you done this ﷺ he said, as I climbed the first step أَتَانِي جِبْرِيلٍ Gabriel, the angel, came. فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ أَذْرَكَ رَمَضَانِ وَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهُ فَأَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ O Muhammad, Jibreel alayhi salam making his dua, may the one who lives to reach the month of Ramadan and does not earn Allah's forgiveness by doing good deeds, may he be distanced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet authenticated the dua by saying, Ameen. And then he climbed the second step and Jibreel made a second dua and said, May he the one who lives to have both of his parents living in old age or one of his parents and does not earn the Jannah and in another riwayah and does not free himself from the fire by doing righteous deeds, may he be distanced by Allah. فَقُلْتُ Amin. So the Rasul said Amin. And then the third, and this is the shahid, the point of reference for you, the Rasul ﷺ climbed the third step and Jibreel made a third and final dua and he said وَمَنْ ذُكِرْتَ عِنْدَهُ فَلَنْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ فَأَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم May he the one that you are remembered in front of and does not send, be, send peace and blessings to you may Allah distance him and the Prophet ﷺ said Amin So let us begin once again by introducing our discussion with you after sending peace and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The topic that was chosen for me 
to discuss with you tonight is in regards to the Islamic identity. I actually do not like this term identity or Islamic identity because I honestly feel as a Muslim who was born and raised in Toronto, in Canada, that Muslims do not really lack identity. They lack basic knowledge. And this is the source of a mix-up in our identity. Identity does not mean the Kufi, the Salaf, the Hijab, the way you dress or the way you talk or saying, inshaAllah, salamu alaykum wa alaykum salam. This is not your identity. These are the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have ordered you with. When you meet your brother, say assalamu alaykum. When you leave him, say assalamu alaykum. The Prophet sallam says, if two people greet each other and shake hands and honestly say assalamu alaykum, grab it. This is a serious word. May Allah bring his peace to you. This is what you're saying. It's not, hello, how are you doing, what's up? Assalamu alaikum. May Allah bring his peace to you. And you shake hands. The Prophet says, when they let their hands go, all of their evil deeds are forgiven. So some things are not your identity. I wish to discuss with you today, in tackling this concept of Islamic identity, three points. And if we understand them, we will be clear about who we are as Muslims. First, and ta'ab. You are nothing more than a servant. Second, innaka satubtala. Since you are a servant of the most merciful, the most bountiful Allah, you shall be tested by Allah. And third, and finally, nasirana al-jannah. My place and your place, our final outcome as Muslims who say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah is the Jannah. And this is our Islamic identity. And you, Muslim man, woman, you are a servant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for one reason. And it's the same as asking what is the purpose of life. Why are you created? Why are you sitting in front of you here today? Why are you on this earth? This question, what is the purpose of life, is the same question as saying, why must I worship Allah? It is the same question. And it is the same answer. Because Allah created you for the sole reason, and ta'bud Allah wa la tushrika bihi shaytan. You are a servant of Allah. Listen to the most merciful. He tells you in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I neither created jinn nor mankind except for the sole purpose and reason for them to worship me. He says in Surah Al-Mulk, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِي الْمُلْكِ He says, أَلَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا It is He, Allah, who created death and then life and put you on this earth as a test for you to show him subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the most obedient of you to him. So this is why you are here, to worship Allah and to ask. And in worshiping Allah, you must possess certain qualities. And this is something that I wish a Muslim man and woman understands and memorizes and instills in his heart. Many of us do not know what worshiping Allah means. To worship Allah, you must possess three characteristics that are unified together. First, you must love Allah. Second, you must fear Allah. And third, you must have hope in Allah's mercy. And these three things must be together. So you must love Allah. And it's not enough to love Allah and not fear Him, because then you are not worshiping Him. How do I explain it? A Muslim man, and we have heard it and seen it with our own ears and eyes, he will not pray Salatul Jumu'ah. He's sitting at work, sitting at his desk, maybe at his lunch break. And he knows that Salatul Jumu'ah is fard, compulsory. Nothing can hold him back except a religious excuse. And working is not one of them. And yet you come and tell him, why aren't you praying Jumu'ah? And he answers you by saying, I love Allah and it's enough. 
I, I love Allah here. You know, I, I'm doing my best. I love Allah. And the kazaz, you're a liar. You love Allah here, but your actions do not perform this love? Another question, another point. A Muslim woman now. She is walking in the street as a billboard. She is a sign to all mankind. When she is not covered in Islamic clothes, so for example, she's walking in the school or in the university or wherever, not dressed Islamically, and she may be wearing alluring clothes, not clothes that's modest, although it's not hijab, she's wearing clothes so that a man will look. She's got herself all perfume. She sat in front of the mirror maybe 45 minutes putting the makeup, attaching the nails, clipping in the earrings, more, more than one, five, six, seven in one ear. And she comes, and she walks in her way, and all the men are looking. And then you ask her, Ya Ukhti, my sister, my mother, my sister in an Islam, my foundation, you are the stepping stone of the Muslim community. Why aren't you wearing hijab? I love Allah. I just... How could you love Allah when it is not shown? So therefore she doesn't fear Allah. So she is a walking billboard to all mankind that at this moment I am in direct disobedience of the orders of Allah. That, that's what it is. Right or wrong, everyone who sees her knows at that moment she's disobeying Allah. She's not even trying to hide it. The Muslim man, Skip Jumat, direct billboard to all mankind. I am now at this moment in Allah's disobedience, knowingly, not hiding. And then they say, I love Allah. You love Allah, MashaAllah. But your love must be proved. This is why the ulama, they explain ayatul intihan, the verse which the scholars have named the text, where Allah tests mankind. Tell them, Ya Muhammad, as in Surah Al Imran, Qul, in kuntum tuhibboon Allah, fattabi'oon. Say, O Muhammad, if you truly love Allah, then show it by following me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's not enough just to say, I love Allah. And it's also not enough just to fear Allah. Because if a person fears Allah only and has no hope that Allah will be merciful to him and forgive his deeds and sins no matter how high they reach unless, as long as he does not disbelieve and take partners with Allah, if a Muslim loses this hope, then he is not worshipping Allah. Why? Because he has lost and has despaired in the mercy of Allah. When Allah says in the Quran, Ya Ibadi, tell them, O Muhammad, Allah calls out to you my servant. What is it to be a servant? Qul Ya Ibadi, al-ladina asrafu ala anfusihim, la taqnatu min rahmatillah, inna Allah hayaqsiru al-dhunuba jami'a. O my servant, who have transgressed against their own soul, have committed evil deeds, unfathomable deeds, do not despair in the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all the all evil, as long as you do not take partners in worship with Him. Innahu huwa al-ghafoor rahim Surely Allah is the most merciful, most forgiving. So you cannot just be fearing Allah. And at the same time, you cannot just hope, oh, it's okay, Allah will forgive you. You cannot just have hope without fear and love of Allah. For if you hope in Allah, you lose your recognition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you lose the sight in recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall punish the disobedience. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, نَبِّئْ عِبَادِي أَنِّي أَنِ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَأَنِّنَ عَذَابِي هُوَ الْعَذَابُ الْأَلِيمُ Proclaim to them, O Muhammad, that surely my punishment, my mercy, is all-encompassing. I'm the most merciful, the most forgiving. But equally tell them that I am the most severe in punishment and torment. Those who disobey blatantly the orders of Allah Azza So therefore, when you worship Allah, knowing now, you know now, and to ask, you are placed on this earth to worship Allah. 
And in worshiping Allah, you must have these three characteristic ingredients. Love Him, fear Him, and hope in His mercy all together. And as you do this, you must fulfill two requirements. Al-ibadah laha ruknayn isnayn. Two requirements that if your worship does not fulfill either one, all of what you have done is not accepted by Allah. Imagine, a person will stand all night, fast all day, and will not receive a single blessing from Allah. The two requirements are ikhlas and sunnah. Sincerity and sunnah. And this is extremely important in recognizing your Muslim identity. That you only worship Allah. And when you worship or do any act of worship, it is solely for Him. Do you know what worship is? Who knows the definition of ibadah? Al-ibadah is munjami' li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah. Min al-aqwal wal af'al al-zahira wal baqinah. In terminology, worship is anything that you do that pleases Allah. Whether it's a statement you make or an action you perform. Hidden inside you, this dua, something only you do, believing in Allah, His angel, Tawheed al uluhiyya Rububiyya, Al-Isma'a Al-Sifat, knowing this, and also actions that you do that other people see you. Prayer, Hajj, Umrah, so this is ibadah. Oh, anything you do that pleases Allah, whether an action or a statement or a belief in, inside that you have. But it must fulfill these two requirements. Ikhlas, sincerity of intention and sunnah. And ikhlas is extremely important. Listen to this frightening hadith. And I say frightening because to me, it is a hadith that should make us cry, tremble, it is narrated from the statement of Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Narrated in the Sahih and Imam Muslim and also Sunan Imam al nasai and many of the other books of Hadith. Abi Hurairah says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Inna awwal al-naas yukza alayhi yawm al-qiyama rajulun al-tushri The first person that will be decided by Allah that he is fitting to be from the people of the fire is a martyr who thought he had in Allah's cause. Let me repeat it. The person who will be first decided by Allah to be thrown in the fire and punished is a person who did jihad. It's pushed. Not just thought, but then was martyred in the battlefield. The Prophet continues with the hadith, he says, فَأُتِيَ Allah shall bring him in front of mankind on the day of judgment. فَعَرَّفَهُ نِعَمَهُ فَعَرَفَهَا Allah shall make clear to him and show him all of his mercy. Allah gives you and I mercy that you may not even understand. Things that when Allah on the day of judgment shall tell you, look, look at all that I have blessed you with, all of my mercy. All of the ease that you have been given. And then this man who died as a martyr shall recognize Allah's mercy to him and bless him. Allah shall question him, What did you do with all that I have given you? I set out in your path and fought in your cause until I met martyrdom. For you. So Allah will answer him, Kazak, you are a liar. إِنَّكَ قَاتَلْتَ لِيُقَالَ هُوَ جَرِيدٌ You fought so that people will say this man is courageous. فَقَدْ قِيلٌ Mankind said it to you. This is your reward. فَأُمِّرَضِ Allah shall order that he be taken. فَسُحِبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ حَتَّى أُلْقِيَ فِي النَّارِ It will be ordered that he be dragged on his face until he is thrown in the fire. وَرَجُلٌ The second person. Whom Allah shall decide is deemed to be worthy of the fire. رجل تعلم العلم وعلم وقرأ القرآن. A man who acquired immense knowledge and taught it. Didn't hide it. He acquired all of the knowledge. Memorized the books, the Quran. وقرأ القرآن. Memorized the Quran. فأتي به. 
Allah shall bring them fa'arrafa ni'amahu showed him his blessing fa'arrafa shall know that Allah blessed him with knowledge and Allah shall say to him fama amilta fiha what have you done and this person shall say fa'allamtu al-ilm wa'allamtu I acquired knowledge and taught it wa'qaratu fiqa al-Qur'an and I recited the Qur'an for your pleasure O Allah kadhat you are lying إِنَّكَ تَعَلَّمْتَ لِيُخَالَ عَالِمًا You learn so that people will say you're a alim. This is the shaykh. This is the maulana. This is the imam. فَقَطِّي And it was said to you. وَقَرَأْ لِيُخَالَ قَارِئًا And you read the Qur'an so that people say, MashaAllah. What a smooth voice. Listen to the tajweed. MashaAllah. And it was said to you. فَأُمِّرَ بِهِ Drag thrown in the fight. وَرَجُلْ the third one أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعَ أَنْوَاعِ الْمَالُ وَأَصْنَاكِ A man, Allah gave all of the different types of wealth not just wealth, but all of the different types فَأُتِيَ بِهِ He shall be brought فَعُرِفَ فَعَرَفَ وَنِعَمَةً Shown the mercies and blessings of Allah to him فَعَرَفَهَا Shall recognize it فَمَا عَمِلْتَ فِيهَا What have you done with all that I have given you? The man shall say the man shall say, مَا تَرَقْتُ سَبِيلًا تُحِبُّ أَنْ يُنْفَقَ فِيهِ إِلَّا أَنْ فَقْتَ فِيهِ Never did I see something that you wished for me to give in charity in, except I did. قَالَ كَذَفْ You lied. إِنَّكَ أَنْ فَقْتُ لِيُقَالَ جَوَادِ You gave to the people who say, He is generous. فَقَسْتِيلْ And it was said to you, فَأُمِرَ بِهِ فَسُحِبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ He will be ordered to be placed in the fire. A serious hadith, my brothers and sisters. And listen to this hadith narrated by Imam al-Nasai. And the son of the hadith is Hassan, as the Shaykh al-Albani points out, in a Sarheeb or Sarheeb, Sahih al-Sarheeb. The Prophet Sallallahu was sitting, and he heard Aba Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu anhu, sitting with some of the Sahaba, speaking about al-Masih al-Dajjal, the one-eyed liar, the Antichrist. Isa salam, shall descend and uh, put an end to his reign on this earth, the 40 days that he shall be here. The Rasul described this Masih of the Jal in other ahadith as the biggest fitna to mankind. Yet, he comes to his Sahaba and he says, أَلَا أُخْبِرُكُمْ بِمَا هُوَ أَخْوَثُ عَلَيْكُمْ عِنْدِي مِنَ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّالِ Should I not tell you what I, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fear for you more than I fear the Antichrist for you? He said, Bala ya Rasulullah, what is it that you fear more than the Antichrist, the one-eyed liar, for us? He told them, Ashirkul Khafi. It is to commit shirk. Do you know what shirk is? Taking partners with Allah that's hidden. And shirk is of two types, shirkul akbar, Major shirk where you take partners with Allah in worship and ibadah. Wa shirkun asghar which is a riya, showing people your actions, hoping for them to praise. The Rasul says, a shirkul khafi, I fear for you more. Hidden shirk. It is, the Prophet describes it, an yaqum al rajul. That a man stands up. Fa yuzayyinu salatah lima yara min nazar al rajul ilayh. That the man, when he stands to pray, he will pray as if you have never seen him praying before. Because he notices that people are looking at him. So he stands up straight, he doesn't slouch, no yawning, no moving around, he's not pulling his, his belt. Praying to perfect his prayer, but not for Allah. Because he notices that a person is looking at him. In another hadith, Rabbi Sallallahu Alaihi he says, إِنَّ أَقْوَفَ مَا أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ الشِّرْقُ الْأَصْفَرِ The most thing that I fear for you is the minor form of shirk. They said, what is this, Ya Rasulullah? قَالَ الْرِيَاءِ Do you know what a riyah is? A riyah مُشْتَقُّ مِنَ الرُّؤْيَةِ It is, it's derived from the word ru'ya, meaning that to see something. In in المُصْطَلَحْ In the مُصْطَلَحْ The ulama of Kufun A riyah هُوَ إِذْهَارُ الْعِبَادَةِ لِكَيْ يَرَاحَ النَّاسِ it is to do a worship so that mankind will look at it and praise it. The Prophet ﷺ described this person who performed the riyah, a riyah. They said, what is this riyah, Ya Rasulullah? What is this punishment? 
he described to them sallallahu alayhi wa by saying that this mura'i when he comes in the day of judgment Allah shall say to him يقول الله يوم القيامة له اذهب إلى من كنت سرائي فانظر هل تجد عندهم من جزاء Go to the people that you used to try to please by worshipping me and see if they shall reward on this day of judgment in an authentic hadith narrated by Imam Muslim the Prophet وسلم, described a debate between a servant and Allah the Most High. He began by laughing. The Rasul sitting amongst the Sahaba began to laugh. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you laughing? After he asked them, why don't you ask me why I laugh? He said, min mujadalati la abdi la I laugh and I am amused at how a person will try to debate with Allah. The Sahaba confused and said, like, how can we debate Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Yaji'u la abdi this person when Allah is deciding his fate, Jannah or fire. He shall say to Allah, Ya Rab, Alam Tu'jirni min al dunya Have you not guaranteed that I will not be oppressed? Fayaqoodu Allahu Bala. Yes, you are guaranteed. La Gulma al Yawm. No oppression in the day of judgment. So this person in his arrogance shall say to Allah, Ibn, Fa inni la aqbalu shahada ta ahad. I do not accept the witness of anything or anyone against me. I don't accept the, the testimony of the angels who are writing everything down. I don't accept the testimony of another human being against me. Jin, nothing. I only wish to testify against myself. So Allah shall seal his mouth. He shall be silent. Allah shall order his arms and his legs to testify against him. So this hand, if you'll say, on this day, I did such and such and such and such. And the next day I did such and such and such and such. And then the next day I did such and such and such. From your beginning to your end. And then your foot shall say, I did such and such and such and such. And Allah records this to us in Surah Yaseen. فَالْيَوْمْ أَلْيَوْمْ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَتَشْهَدُ أَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْتِبُونَ On the day of judgment, we shall make their hands speak and their feet bear witness against them about what they used to earn in disobeying Allah. So we have discussed with you an nakaat You are a servant of the Most Merciful. And therefore when you are worshipping Allah, you must have ikhlas. And equally you must follow sunnah. If you were to have as much ikhlas as you could and then try to worship Allah in a way that was not sunnah, it is rejected. So no one can come and say, for example, on Laylatul Qadr, pray 100 rakah. I mean, each rakah recite, Qul Allah Ahad a hundred times, as we have read with our own eyes. People invent things, invent worship. So even if you stood with full ikhlas to worship Allah, but yet what you're doing is not sunnah, it is not accepted from you. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ وَالْحَدِيثِ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ In that read upon hadith, whoever worships in a way that we have not ordered, have not sanctioned, have not shown, have not done, this worship is rejected back to him. It is not accepted by Allah. فَأَنْتَ عَلَيْهِ so now in building your Islamic identity, you realize that you are sent here as a worshipper of Allah. Our second point of discussion, al istila You shall be put to test in trial. Do not think it's easy to be Muslim in our day today. For this is the stage of al ghurbah We are back to the days of strangeness. People look at you as if you're strange. One of my beloved teachers and elders, I don't know if you have met him or have heard him speak, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick. We were walking in the downtown, in the city core in, uh, in Toronto. And we're dressed in our nice diab, you know, mashallah, got our beards combed and our hats and our kufis, and we think we're dressed nice. 
You know, he's got his white turban. I don't know if you've seen the way Sheikh Abdullah Hakim may Allah bless him dress it. And we're walking, we're going to his van. And two men, subhanAllah, or what seem to be men, I, I'm not, I'm not, to this day I'm not sure. Maybe 40 earrings in each ear, two studs, something in his tongue, a few things hanging off his beard, his hair like blue, and he's got, one of them's got a girlfriend, and they're dressed in grubby clothes. Like, if I was a disbeliever, I would never, ever, consider even wearing one of the garments they had on, let alone all of them at the same time. And they're walking by us, and they look at us, and they just pause there and like, look at these people, as if they're looking at us in a degrading manner. And I turn to the Shaykh and I say, SubhanAllah, look at how they're dressed. Wallahi, if you were to put a rope, you could drag them like cattle from their nose. And we were amused, but this is the way it is. This is life now, living in the major city, at the very least. You seem strange. Your dress, your clothes are iron. But because it's not the norm, you are made fun of. SubhanAllah. And this is what the Rasul predicted. Bada al Islam gharib. Islam began as something strange. And it shall return to being strange. Tafuba lil ghuraba. Glad tidings be to those who are strange. So these are the days we are living in today. You will be tested. In many different ways. You'll be tested in school. I give you a, a, a personal example. Actually, it's not something that's bad. It's something that I feel good about. I had an exam at the university. It's an elective course that I took at forensic science. And these courses based on psychology and biology and chemistry. And the way the course is, the exam, you have two exams, 40% and 40%. And I had Salatul Jumu'ah, and I was giving it at a masjid that I couldn't back out of, Masjid Qara. I couldn't phone them and say, I'm not coming, because there's lots of people, thousands of people for Jumu'ah. And it was too late for me to get out of the test and to get out of it. The test is at 2 p.m. And Jumu'ah starts 12.30. And it's on all the way to the other end of the city. I finished Jumu'ah by 2. We prayed, got out of the masjid as quick as I could, 2 o'clock. Got in my car and I'm speeding, I'm flying. I reached the university 2.30. I have half an hour left for this test. And I sit down and it's 69 questions. I'll never forget it. 69 questions, and I'm sitting there, and it's all multiple choice. And I sit and I do the first 21 questions. And every answer is A. <laughs> every answer is A, 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 A. The whole test. And I must have made a mistake. So I go back and I'm like, what's going on? The time expired, and I just decide everything's A. So I fill the whole test paper, A, 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 A. 69 A. Two weeks later, we get the printout of our exam mark. Actually, I checked it was on the internet. I checked my exam mark, and I got 100%. On, I only answered 21 questions. I got, I got 100%. We come to the lecture, and the professor says, we were doing the psychological component. And in psychology, people doubt themselves. This is what they were trying to teach him. That a person will always doubt himself. He goes, not a sick only one person in the whole lecture got everything A. And it happens to be me who never actually did the test. So as a Muslim, you will be tested. I came to this professor and I told him, look, I got this and, you know, please give me a break. Let me have ten more minutes. Just ten. At least let me finish half the test. He says no. And this is just a quick example of knowing that just because the way you are, the way you dress, maybe he doesn't know me. I'm not actually a regular person who attends these lectures because I like to study on my own, do the reading. Especially for things like this, they have some pictures that I don't like to see. It's about friends of friends. So he doesn't really know me, or what kind of student I am. So he was really adamant about that, the time. And alhamdulillah, Allah gives victory. So as you know, you shall be tested. 
Allah tells us in the Quran in the beginning of Surah Al Ankabut, Alif Lam Mim, أحسب الناس أن يصرفوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يسكنون. Alif Lam Mim, does mankind, do people actually think that they should be left alone to say we believe? Without Allah testing their resolve in Him, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ Surely we tested those who came before them. فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ We tested those who came before them and we made it clear and known those who were truthful in belief and those who were liars and hypocrites. Look at the prophets of Allah. Let us look at Ulul Azim, Nuh, Noah. He came to his people lived for 950 years saying La ilaha illallah, worship Allah. After 950 years, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا أَمَنَ مَعَهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Only few people accepted his da'wah, accepted Islam. One of his sons disbelieved. His wife disbelieved. 950 years calling to Allah. Until Nuh, and from this dua that is recorded in Surah Nuh, let it sink into you the pain that he must have felt. He said, وَقَالَ نُوحٌ Allah tells us in the Qur'an, Nuh calls out to us, رَبِّ لَا تَذَرَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ دَيَّارًا O Allah, do not leave a single disbeliever on the face of this earth. I've had enough. And Allah answered his dua, and the flood came upon the earth. Ibrahim, Abraham, Abu Al-Anbiya, Allah describes Ibrahim, Abraham, by himself as a whole nation in his belief and resolve in Allah. Look at his test. He came to his people, his father, his mother. قَالُوا حَرِّقُوا Burn him, throw him in the fire. And they did. Throw him in the fire. وَنْصُرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ And give victory to your false God. Ibrahim tested again in his own children. He came to Ismail and he tells him Ismail and he tried to think what you would do. He comes to Ismail and he says, Inni ara fil manam anhi azzahak. I see in a dream. Not Jibreel came down and told me that Allah ordered you. He says, I see in a dream that I am ordered to slaughter you. A father speaking to his son. That I am ordered in my dream to slaughter you. Well, how did his son answer? My father, do as you are, as you are ordered. Look at the resolve and belief. In a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says that Ismail, as Ibrahim put him to the stone and covered his face, Ismail says, My father, Ya Abati, turn my face away from you. Washud the thiyaba and raise your clothing, pick up your clothing. I do not wish my blood to touch your clothes so that you descend from this mountain and my mother sees my blood on your clothes and she feels despair. Look at his Iman. And as Ibrahim put him down to slaughter him, Ibrahim, We called unto him, O Ibrahim, you have believed in what you were ordered in your dream. And in another surah, we brought down a ram to be slaughtered in his place. The test from Allah, Musa, Moses, he came to the people, disbelieved by Fir'aun and disbelieved by the Jews themselves, those who he came to save. People invent things, invent worship. So even if you stood with full ikhlas to worship Allah, but yet what you're doing is not sunnah, it is not accepted from you. This is why the Prophet said, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْهُ وَالْحَدِيثُ مُتَّفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ In the agreed upon hadith, whoever worships in a way that we have not ordered, have not sanctioned, have not shown, have not done, this worship is rejected back to him. It is not accepted by Allah. فَأَنْتَ عَدْهُ so now in building your Islamic identity, you realize that you are sent here as a worshipper of Allah. Our second point of discussion, Al-Ibtilaq. You shall be put to test and trial. Do not think it's easy to be Muslim in our days 
today. For this is the stage of al ghurba We are back to the days of strangeness. People look at you as if you're strange. One of my beloved teachers and elders, I don't know if you have met him or have heard him speak, Shaykh Abdullah Hakim Quick. We were walking in the downtown, in the city core, in, the, in Toronto. And we're dressed in our nice siyad, you know, mashallah, got our beard combed and our hats and our kufis, and we think we're dressed nice. You know, he's got his white turban. I don't know if you've seen the way Shaykh Abdullah Hakim, may Allah bless him, dress it. And we're walking, we're going to his van. And two men, subhanAllah, or what seem to be men, and I'm not, I'm, to this day I'm not sure, maybe 40 earrings in each ear, two studs, something in his tongue, a few things hanging off his beard, his hair like blue, and he's got, one of them's got a girlfriend, when Ayyadu Billah, and they're dressed in grubby clothes. Like, if I was a disbeliever, I would never, ever, consider even wearing one of the garments they had on, let alone all of them at the same time. And they're walking by it, and they look at us, and they just pause there and like, look at these people, as if they're looking at us in a degrading manner. And I turn to the sheikh and I say, SubhanAllah, look at how they're dressed. Wallahi, if you were to put a rope, you could drag them like cattle from their nose. And we were immune, but this is the way it is. This is life now, living in the major city, at the very least. You seem strange. You're dressed, your clothes are ironed, but because it's not the norm, you are made fun of. SubhanAllah. And this is what the Rasul predicted. بدأ الإسلام غريب. Islam began as something strange. And it shall return to being strange. فقوبا إذا أحب الله عبدا السلام. When Allah loves the servant of his third building place. فقال. He answers. لبنة من ذهب ولبنة من فضة. A brick of gold, a brick of silver. وملاطها المنكها المس. The cement that holds the two bricks together of your house in the Jannah is of musk, sweet smelling perfume. وَحَصْبَعُهَا اللُّؤْلُؤُ وَالْيَاقُوتِ The stones when you're walking, or the pebbles, are made of pearls and emeralds. وَتُرَابُهَا الزَّعْفُرَانِ Saffron is this dirt. مَنْ يَدْخُلْهَا يَنْعَمْ وَلَا يَبْحَى The one who enters the Jannah shall feel happiness and never sadness. وَيَحْلُدْ وَلَا يَمُوتِ shall live in it forever and never taste death. وَلَا يَفْنَا شَبَابُ Never will he you lose his youthfulness. وَلَا تَبْلَا ثِيَابُ And never will his clothing become out of dated or worn out. Allah describes to you the Jannah by saying وَالسَّهَبِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ Those who are foremost in the dunya in worshiping Allah shall be the foremost in the hereafter. They are the ones that are nearest to Allah. Where? Fi Jannat al Na'im. Amidst gardens of paradise. Kullatun min al Awaleen wa Qaleelun min al Aakhirin. Many from the early generations of Al Islam. This is why you follow the Sahaba. Al Imam Ahmad, Al Imam Malik, Al Imam al Shafi, Al Imam al Aqam, Abu Hanifa. This is why you follow them. They are the greatest of generations. Kullatun min al Awaleen. They are the most that shall enter the Jannah and be the foremost in it. وَقَلِيدٌ مِنَ الْآخِرِينَ And few from our generation. عَلَى صُرِّ الْمَوْضُونَ Reclining on raised thrones that have embroidered in them gold and jewels. مُتَّكِئِينَ عَلَيْهَا مُتَقَابِرِينَ Sitting and lying facing one another in a reclining position. يَطُوفُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلْدَانُ الْمُخَلَّدُونَ بِأَكْوَابٍ وَأَبَارِيخَ وَكَأْسٍ مِنْ مَعِينٍ Passing around them as servants are youth of perpetual, are children of perpetual youth, bringing to them wine for them to drink. And do not ever confuse anything in the Jannah with what you have here today. For what is in the Jannah, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and never can be imagined by you. So the wine will not make you intoxicated. 
لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينبكون never will they be heavy headed or intoxicated from drinking it وفاتحة مما يتخيرون and fruit that they may choose whatever they wish again when we say fruit it doesn't mean the brown bananas that we have here or an orange that if you cut it your life goes all the way through no in the Jannah it is different the names are the same but the taste the color the look the smell is different I leave you with a final hadith narrated by Imam Muslim the Prophet says to the Sahaba فَأَلَى مُوسَى بْنِ عِمْرَانَ رَبَّهِ Moses asked his Lord listen to the question and we know Musa, Moses used to speak and converse with Allah without a barrier in hearing or sound he could not see Allah but he could speak with him Musa asked Allah مَا أَجْنَى أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ مَنْزِلَةِ what is the lowest level I repeat what is the lowest the minimum in the Jannah. Allah answered him by saying, it will be given to a man, Rajul. Yaji, he shall come. بعد أن دخل أهل الجنة في الجنة وبعد أن أخذوا منازلهم وأخذوا أخذاتهم This man, he will come after all of the people who were allowed the Jannah, paradise, shall be given paradise and shall take whatever they wish from it. And Allah shall make it seem to this person that there is no room in the Jannah. Not a single seat. Not even an eyelash of room in the Jannah. Allah shall come, go to the Jannah. It will seem, فَيَظُنَّ أَنَّهَا مَلْأَةً He shall think it's full. فَيَرْجَعْ He shall return to Allah. فَيَقُولْ فَكَيْفَ يَا رَبُّ وَقَدْ أَخَذَ النَّاسُ أَخَذَاتِهِمْ وَنَزَلُوا مَنَازِلَهُمْ How can I enter when everything is taken? Nothing for me. So Allah shall answer him by saying, Afarba, Subhanallah. Allah asking his servant, Would you be pleased if, Would you be pleased if, An yakuna laka mulku malikin min muluk dunya Would you be pleased if I gave you the kingdom and dominion of the richest of kings to live on this earth? And this is from Allah. Not something I'm saying I'll give you hundred dollars if you answer my question. No. Allah saying, would you be pleased if I gave you the kingdom of a king from this earth that you used to live on? And the man shall say, Allah, surely, O oh Allah, I will take it. فَيَقُولُ لَكَ ذَلِكَ Allah shall say, you have this kingdom. وَمِثْلَهُ 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 You are given this kingdom. And once more, and once more, and once more, and once more. And on the fifth, this humble servant shall say, Rabbis Ya Rabb, it's enough for me, O oh Allah. Five kingdoms from the riches of kings to live on this earth. This is the lowest level. And it's not finished yet. Allah shall say, Laka kullu dhalik. These five are for you. Wa ashratu amzali. And ten times its amount. This is for you and me in the Jannah. This is why you are a servant. This is why you withstand the pressure and the trial. And you have patience. لَكَ كُلُّ ذَلِكَ وَعَشَرَةُ أَمْثَالِكَ These five kingdoms and ten times, meaning fifty times the kingdom of the richest of kings of this earth. فَيَقُولُ الْعَبْدُ رَضِيهِ The servant shall say, O oh Allah, it is enough. So Musa perplexed. He says, Ya Rabb, فَمَا ذَالُ أَعْلَاهَا أَعْلَاهَا مَنْ بِلَا If this is the lowest, O oh Allah, what about the highest? Musa wants to know, he's a prophet. He wants to know what he shall receive. So Allah tells him, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَرَسْ Musa don't ask. These are the ones that I have chosen. غَرَصْتُ كَرَامَتَهُمْ بِيَدَيْهِ وَخَتَمْتُ عَلَيْهَا I have planted their honor with my own hands and I have sealed it. No one knows. فَلَا عَيْنٌ رَقْحٍ No eye has seen. وَلَا أُذُنٍ no ear has heard and no human being's heart could ever imagine what is set in store so I leave you with these words I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has gathered us from our different cities and our different places 
together with all once again in Jannah al Firdaus with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك تبارك اسمك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I actually don't know if there are questions or if they are allowing questions. I know I've taken a little bit of time. Uh, if the questions are related to the topic, if they're oral or written, uh, I will do my best. I don't know what uh, you know, these uh, decide. Um, inshallah, we're going to have a question and answer session now. And inshallah, there's some brothers who are going to give us the papers now. So I request the brothers to give us the papers. Time. If there's an oral question, if someone has a question he wishes to ask, public. <laughs> Actually, uh, I used to have uh, the brother, he says, tried to tell the brothers and sisters not to answer their exams in the way you did. Uh, I was blessed actually by having a Muslim OEC chemistry teacher who uh, he did a chemical engineering degree and he said I used to test myself by going into exams and things that I've never read about that have multiple choice and try to do and answer as good as I can and there's a, there are certain systems and certain things that if you know you can uh, you know figure out how to answer uh, multiple choice and other uh, types of questions but usually A is not the answer so uh, Stay away from me. <laughs> so the first question it says, what will happen to the Muslims who delay their salah in their life? Uh, this is a, a serious question. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the Quran was revealed to him, in Surah Maryam, there is an ayah that says, فخلف من بعدهم خلف أضاعوا الصلاة واتبعوا الشهوات فسوف يلقون غيا. In Surah Maryam, Allah describing the Prophet and after they passed away, after a Prophet of Allah was sent and he passed away, the people that he left behind, they would begin gradually to delay their prayers. To delay their prayers. So Allah in the Quran says, فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا They shall be punished with something named Al-Ghay. And Imam Ibn Kathir and Imam Al-Qurtubi and other Imams of Tafsir, they describe to us Al-Ghay. Although there is an authentic hadith describing it from the Prophet ﷺ, they bring to us generations of Abdullah ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud describing Al-Ghay wadin fi jahannam. Wadi fi jahannam. This ghay, this severe punishment that is promised to the one who delays the salah, not leaves it, but the one who makes us at Maghrib time. Maghrib with Isha, Fajr after the sun, Dhuhr with us. For these people who delay, not miss it, they shall be rewarded with al ghay. Wadim fi jahannam, they will be in a valley in the fire. Da'idun qa'ru, deep in the fire. Khabifun ta'amu Evil to, evil to speak about, evil to mention Tashma'iddu minhu ahlun naab All of the people that are in the fire ask Allah to stay away from this place For the one who delays the salah So what about the one who misses the salah? So this is, I hope, enough of an answer What will happen to the Muslims if they, they, they delay their salah? The second question also from the same person, what will happen to the Muslim parents who did not complete their duty? 
The Muslim parent who does not complete his duties shall find that his children shall not complete their duties. Except on whom Allah has mercy. Meaning, Allah tells us in I think verse number 9 in Surah Al-Nisa, فَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ تَرَقُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً دِعَاثًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ فَلْيَسْتَقُوا اللَّهُ وَلْيَقُولُوا قَوْلًا فَدِيدًا Allah instructing the parents who have children, if you are in fear that your son or your daughter will not practice Islam or will not be righteous, let them, those who have this fear, let them themselves fear Allah and let them speak a straightforward word. Meaning that your son and your daughter, generally speaking, will be your reflection. So the Muslim parents must realize this. That if he is a person who does not eat halal and feeds his children halal, they are grown with this. And the Prophet ﷺ says, whatever is raised on eating haram, the fire is more needy of him than anything else. Is more deserving of him. So the parent must be fearful for himself and for his children. For you will be brought on the day of judgment with your children hanging on to your neck as is in the different hadith and narration, and they shall be holding on to your neck. And they shall say to Allah, my father did not teach me. He did not say pray when salat time came. He did not teach me how to make wudu. Wallahi, I have seen children, 15 years old, who do not know how to say as lillah. In the University of Toronto, one of my brother's acquaintances, I do not call him a friend, a Muslim from an Arab country, raised his whole life, 16 years of his life in an Arab country. He came to Canada seven years ago. My brother attends an Arabic class that the university holds because it has an Arabic speaking program in it. And the teacher is a Jew, but she plays for them the Quran so that they will learn what it sounds like. And this young man in his second year of university, seven years after leaving a Muslim country, he turns to my brother and he says, do you know this is my first time to hear the Quran in seven years? My first time to hear the Quran in seven years. My brother, he says, what about Salah? Forget listening, what about Salah? Don't you at least read Al-Fatiha? Because I haven't prayed in nine years. Nine years. My brother brought him to the Jumu'ah. We have the Jumu'ah in the university. A lot of Muslim students in our university, Toronto, maybe six, seven thousand. Yet surprisingly, you only have maybe four, five, six hundred Muslims who attend Jumu'ah. So it's about, you know, not even, I wouldn't say ten percent, not even a quarter of that. We'll come to Jumu'ah. And my brother brought him along. He found great difficulty in sitting on the ground listening to the Jum'ah that was 20 minutes in length. He couldn't take sitting no more. He had to get up and stand and crick, you know, walk around. He's not accustomed to sitting. He didn't know what to do in Salah with Mis'at. Who is at fault? Surely the youth, this person is at fault, yet his parents shall be asked by Allah. What have you taught your child? Listen to this blessed hadith, the first hadith in Sahih Muslim. The first hadith, it begins by Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar saying, Haddathani Abdi. My father narrated to me that the Rasul said, as a Muslim parent, what have you narrated to your child? This is what they used to say. My father taught me. My father Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said to me, the Rasul Sallallahu said, what will you leave back for your children? And this is one of the three things that after you pass away, you will get blessings for. عِلْمٌ يُنْتَفَعُ بِهِ وَلَكُمْ صَالِحْ يَدْعُ لَهِ أَوْ صَدَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ A charity you have given in the cause of Allah, or a young man or daughter, your children, who will grow up to be righteous to make dua for you. Or, or you have taught someone beneficial knowledge that they will keep on passing along. So this is an important question, hopefully it is a sufficient answer 
for it, insha'Allah. Another, another question is, so do you say that the woman should wear the scarf so that the men look at, so that the men won't look at them? But if they stand out, the men will look at them. You are mistaken for many reasons. First, the Muslim woman does not just wear a scarf. That's first. So the Muslim woman, hijab, it is not something you just wear. It's your whole attitude. Right? Hijab is not this. Anyone can do that. Hijab is humbling yourself to Allah, knowing that He has ordered you as your Creator to be worshipping of Him and follow His guidance. And from His guidance to you is that you as a Muslim woman must cover yourself. Do you know that the shaitan, the first thing he attacked Adam and Eve, Adam and Hawa with, with, was trying to remove their garments. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, let not the shaitan deceive you. لا يَفْتِنَنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ كَمَا أَخْرَجَ أَبَوَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ Let not the shaytan deceive you as he tricked your parents from before you. How did he trick them? يَنْزِعُ عَنْهُمَا لِبَاسَهُمَا By removing their garments off them. This is why Adam and Hawa were kicked out of the Jannah. Why? The shaytan came, يَنْزِعُ Remove their garments off them by whispering to them. Why? إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُ Surely the shaytan and his tribe see you from a place that you see them not. So therefore the hijab is not just something you wear, it's the order of Allah because you are protecting yourself from the shaytan. It's not only the sight of men. Second, quickly, the hijab, it is seven things. Seven different levels that all must be combined together. Covering every part of the body except the hands and the face. This is the first. Second, the clothing must be wide, encompassing, not tight, not revealing. Third, it should not be perfumed. Fourth, it should not attract the sight of men. Fifth, it should not be in the same type of clothing that a man naturally or normally wears. So I don't mean a pair of uh, running shoes. You can have the same running shoes that a man wears. But you cannot dress in clothes that is exclusive for men. For example, Wallahi, I was shocked. I'm walking one day and I saw a person wearing, do you know the, Sa- the Saudi, the red kufiya? I'm thinking it's a brother. Salaamu alaykum ya The person turns around, it's a woman. Do you, do you see the difference? Clothing that's exclusive for a man, you can't wear. For many different reasons, such as that. Also, the clothing that you wear, it must not be shafat, meaning it cannot be see-through. It cannot be see-through. And for and seventh and finally, it must not be the same in the same manner that the clothing that the that disbelieving women are accustomed to wear. So these are the levels of hijab in clothing. Hijab also means dignifying yourself in acting in a certain manner. And I narrated to the brothers in the Jumu'ah that I gave today the story of a Muslim sister, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy and bring down his patience upon her heart and upon her family's heart. A Muslim woman not much older or younger than you are today, 19 years old, in a city in Ontario, I will not tell you which city due to the sensitivity of this issue. 19 years old, her parents made the most difficult and worst decision of their life, which was they allowed her to live on the residence of the university. They allowed her to live with women. It's a woman's residence, but she's sharing bathrooms, cooking utensils, a kitchen with a Sikh, two Christians, and a Buddhist. She's living with them. They're all women. Her parents allowed her. She's a freshman, first year of the university. She doesn't wear hijab. She doesn't cover herself. She was soon invited to a party, as is common in all of the universities. She was given a drink that she swears by Allah she did not know contained alcohol. She began to drink and to drink, thinking it's fruit punch. 
and, and you may laugh. You may laugh. She drank. Quickly, and, and as you laugh, I am sure what I will say next will affect you. For Wallahi, when I heard it, it brought me to tears. When I was confronted with it, lies. She drank and she became intoxicated and passed out. She woke up later to find that she had been raped. Not once, not twice, not by one man, not by two, but by three different men. The police were informed. They call her father's house 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning. And they say to him, this has transpired, this has happened to your doctor, the man being of an older age, being of a advanced in age, when he heard the news, he suffered a heart attack, and he passed away. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon him. And then we recite in the Qur'an, we listen in Ramadan, in Surah Al-Ahzab, the Prophet telling us, the Prophet ordered by Allah, Ya ayyuhal Nabi, O Prophet of Allah, tell your wives, kulli azwajid, don't tell anyone else, first. Tell your wives, tell your wives, Aisha, Khadija, tell them, Wadanatik, and then your daughters, Wanisa'il Mu'mineen, and then tell all of the believing women, what should you order them with, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yudneena Alayhinna Min Jalabibihim, tell them to cover themselves, and draw their veils over their bodies, Thalika Adna An Yu'arafna Fala Yu'zayn, this will be better for them so that they will be covered and known to be free, respectable Muslim women. And surely Allah is the most forgiving, the most merciful. So to answer your question, you will not stand out because you wear hijab. And if you stand out, it will be for a good reason. You will stand out as a person, yeah, don't talk to her, she's not like that. This is why you will stand out. So hopefully what we have said is a sufficient answer. Wallahu a'ala. To the previous. What happened, or what should you do when your father or your mother say that you, you are to take off your hijab or you get out of the house? And you are still not in financial safety, I presume, to take care of yourself. Honestly, I feel I should not dignify this as an answer. Because any man that tells his daughter not to wear hijab, he is not a man. He's not a man. And he should know this, and this should be carried to him, and if he has a question, he can come and talk to me. And I will tell him you are not a man. And I say this openly. How could anyone consider saying such a ignorant statement that not even a disbeliever would say. How could someone say something so ridiculous as to tell their daughter if you don't wear hijab, get out of my house? This person, if he dies in this state, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have mercy upon him, he will be in the fire as a repentance for these deeds. And he should know this. And how could the mother, who is a woman herself, allow such a statement to take place. It is important for us to understand that the laws of Allah are not something we play with. An Imam Shafi'i, a person came to him and he said, what if a hadith is carried to me that the Rasul said, not Allah, the Rasul وسلم, and I don't want to do it. The Shafi'i, an Imam Shafi'i, he said to this man, pretend that the Rasul is standing in front of you and tell him no. What's the difference? fighting the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could any person with any amount of belief or intelligence say such a statement? SubhanAllah. May Allah soften his heart and bring him to the truth and the iman of those who are righteous and fearing of Allah. How do you recommend a sister to lower her gaze is the next question. 
this is a question that is important. Lowering the gaze is an order that Allah ordered the men and then the women with. Allah says to the believing man, lower your gaze. This is more beneficial for your belief in Allah. And then he says, وَكُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Tell the believing women, Ya Rasulullah, to lower their gaze also. Lowering the gaze does not mean that you walk and bump your head in a tree. It's not what it means. But lowering the gaze means صَرْقُ النَّظَرِ That when you see haram, you remove yourself. So you're not walking like this. You're walking in a, in a normal manner. But when something is disobedient to Allah, that you know you are not permitted to see, and it's inside you. If you have belief, you know. I should not, even if you don't have belief, you know inside you, you should not be looking at this. And automatically you are supposed to turn your gaze. So this hopefully, inshallah, is enough of an indicator of what to do or how you should feel right before you need to lower your gaze. That if you have belief, this will come and it will be natural. It will be second hand to you. Whoever it is, whether you're talking, you know, Wallahi, if Hillary Clinton's right here, I would not dignify her with a look. You would not dignify her with a look. And the same should be if it is a Muslim woman. And if it's Bill Clinton over here, hopefully no one will dignify him with a look, inshallah. The next question. If a group of people enter the masjid after jama'ah, should they pray by themselves? We hear this question every city we travel to. If you come to a masjid, and that the imam, this masjid is known to have imam rafiq, an imam that is there for the five daily prayers, do not make a second jama'ah. Even if you have come late, do not. But if you are in a state of travel like myself, and I come to al masjid al-Islami, for example, and I come there, or Masjid al-Sunnah in Montreal, if I come, and the jama'ah has been finished, and the Imam al rafid they have all left the masjid and no one is there, and you and your brother or another person come, you can make the second jama'ah. The question that you should ask is, if we pray in jama'ah, or if we do not pray in jama'ah, is the salah accepted, and unanimously amongst all of the fuqaha, yes. So do not make it an issue that you ask every time, every different sheikh or imam or student of knowledge that comes, you ask him, should we make a second jama'ah if we miss the first? Generally speaking, no. But if it is something that will cause no harm, then it is permitted, wallahu alam. How should we treat Muslims who call themselves gay? Do not laugh. Do not laugh. Because these are things that the society now, wal ayyadu billah, has uh, brought forth upon the Muslim ummah. First, homosexuality is not natural. Neither for the man nor for the woman. Why do we say this? The man was created to fulfill certain functions. And this is how you know what your purpose is. Homosexuality is not one of them, neither biologically, emotionally, physically. I asked a teacher once, she was a person who advocated, allowed them to have the right to be teachers, to be whatever garbage they throw at you. And this teacher, she said, well why would, I said to her, would you like to have a male teacher who is openly homosexual to teach your five-year-old child in kindergarten, listen to her answer, because you have to even know, these people that defend, they know the truth. She answers by saying, not because he's gay, he's going to rape my child. I told her, by saying that, you have shown what you are feeling. By saying that, you know what you are feeling. Homosexuality is a disease biologically. This is what they try to say to you. It's something we are created with. And this is rubbish. There's no gene, no enzymes, no nothing to prove it. It is something that the shaitan has placed in these people from the beginning of Lut, Lut's time. The Prophet ﷺ making the hajj, 
the punishment of the homosexual, Muslim or other, that when he is found, it is one of two things. A person who is homosexual and asks to repent and does not, he is to be thrown off the highest building. I live in front of the steam tower. Or burned with fire. This is their hadith. This is the extent. Because this person has a disease that he cannot control unless he repents to Allah. So you will find that the man who is gay, he will be as promiscuous as a man. A man is known that he's promiscuous. He likes many women. But yet, but yet, he will be coveting at the same time like a woman. And they will fall into the evil deeds that you hear every day about in the news. A man walking into a pool doing this to this child. So there is no such a thing that a gay Muslim. You're either Muslim or you're not. But to play with words and to say, well, I'm Muslim and I just happen to be in this thing, it is correct. You may enter the Jannah. If Allah has mercy upon you, no one is allowed to take another person away from Islam unless they declare it. But you should be punished for this sin and you should repent for it. For if you do not repent, Allah shall inflict his punishment upon you. AIDS is a homosexual disease and it will be proven biologically and chemically. It's a disease that is founded in the homosexual community, spread from them brought from them, breed it in them, and then it spreads to the other people. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the mercy and the guidance and to keep us away from people of such a thing. And for the Muslim people who may know such a person, cut him off. Tell him to repent and stay away from him. Do not be in or around his or her region. Uh, 8.30 we will end. So that's another 20 minutes ago. What do you do in a situation where you are put into a group with someone from the opposite gender? Fear Allah as much as possible. And if you have the ability to be removed from this group or to go to another group, do so at uh, the quickest or the most possible uh, or leisurely manner, inshaAllah. How does one increase his or her love and fear and hope in Allah? A person increases his love, hope, and fear in Allah by understanding these principles that we have discussed with you today and by implementing them in their life. To love Allah, show Him. To love Allah, show Him. Make dua, make this, pray at night. Many of you, I, I know, you will say, what do you mean pray at night? It's hard enough to pray the five daily prayer. Many Muslims now, no one wakes up at night. Illa man rahim Allah, may Allah have mercy on us. Do you know the night prayer? One of the scholars of Islam, he said, Wallahi, by Allah, if the mushrik, if the disbelievers knew the love that I have for praying at night, they would come and try to take it from me more than trying to come and take my land. And we know that disbelievers take our land. But if they knew this love that I had inside me, they would try to capture it instead of my land. It is a love that you have for Allah when you know that you have woken in this time when many of the people are either sleeping or committing their sin. And you stand to Allah in prayer. Turn to Him, hoping in Him, fearing in Him, and asking Him for whatever you wish. For whatever you wish. And this, I think, is the most significant way of increasing your love and fear in Allah. To recognize the bounds of Allah and to fulfill your obligations to Him. And the Prophet ﷺ, he teaches us, never will a person do the, the, the wajibat unless you will come closer to Allah. And when you do all of the compulsory actions, then you begin to do the nawafil. The secondary actions, you come closer and closer to Allah. So this is how we develop our belief in Allah. 
What kind of sincere advice do you give the youth in Montreal? Is it to build an Islamic community? Jazakallah khayr. Of course I give the advice build an Islamic community. But there has to be a foundation. You can't build a building starting from the top. So if the youth are going to be this foundation, the pillar, alhamdulillah. But if it's going to be half stepping or you're fronting, you're not doing it right, stay away from it. If you're going to take the responsibility, see it all the way through. Do it for Allah, but don't do it for any other reason. Build, Allah ordered, a masjid that is raised on the foundations of fearing Allah. A building is just a building, but its principles and what it stands for and what sweat and toil has been put in it shall be the deciding factor. So if you want an Islamic community, it will only be raised on the foundations of fearing Allah Azza wa Jal. Do we have to grow the beard under the chin or the shin? Explain how the beard should be grown. Don't shave. How do we help family members? Don't shave, that's the answer. How do we help family members to practice Islam if they have strayed? The most arrogant thing that a person can do is think that he is better than someone else. And this is something that the shaitan was the full example of. Do you know the shaitan was kicked out because of one raqah, one frustration? How many of you missed many? Shaitan won prostration. Allah ordered him prostrate. He said no. Halal. One. If you explain it in a humble manner, and the shaitan did not prostrate because of his arrogance, I'm I'm better than Adam. I'm from fire. He's from dirt. Logic. This is his logic. Shaitanic logic. Arrogance. Do not be arrogant with any human being. Whether it's your son or your father, be humble. Give them sincere advice. My father, my son, listen to what Allah has said in the Quran. I, I doubt that any Muslim father who has strayed will not feel some type of joy that his son or his daughter brings the Quran and she says, My father, I want you to read this verse. And the verse says, Verily, Salah was prescribed to be prayed at their specific time. As a reminder, that is enough. Give a good word. A good word is better than argument and discussion. Give something that will benefit you, something that you feel will be accepted from whomever you are giving the da'wah to. And do not label anyone who strayed, for only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows truly what is in the hearts of the people. In the beginning we described to you a person who will not pray Jumu'ah or the sister who will not wear hijab and they say they love Allah. That may very well be correct, they love Allah. But it's not showing. And showing is the half the battle, it's the second half of the issue. So do not ever, do not come to this person and say, you stray. Do not be a badgering person, but be someone who is respectful and good in manners, inshaAllah. How do you go about telling a person that he has a bad tongue and that surely this is something that is found many, many, in many places in the Ummah that people speak in evil ways, lies, cheating, backbiting, namima. You tell the person again with good advice. I think the best advice that you can give is having the person read it for himself. So you go and you bring the hadith, Riyadh al-Saliheen, the chapter of uh, of uh, evil things. And from it, I think the first one on the list is the tongue. And you bring to him and you say, read this. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مَحَدِيثُ بِنْ صَحِيحُ مُسْلِمْ صَعَيْتَلَّمْ أَتَدْرُونَ مَلْغِيبَ Do you know what that biting is? قَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَلْغِيبَ هَيَا ذِكْرُكَ أَخَاكَ بِمَا يَقْرَى It is to speak of your brother in a way that he would hate. So the Sahaba told the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is such and such and such and such. He told them, if he is, this is ghibah. This is backbiting. 
and that fighting Allah describes it in the Quran, eating the dead flesh of your brother. Eating dead flesh of your brother. أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِفْتُ مِي Would you wish to eat this dead flesh of your brother? You would hate it. This is غِيبَ نَمِيمَ مَنْ النَّمَّام لَا يَكُلُ الْجَنَّةِ The person who makes نَمِيمَ meaning transmits from one party to another word to make them fight with one another he shall never enter the Jannah. Having the person understand the seriousness of it. And if the person continues, cut him off. Stay away from him. For he will not be a person that will benefit you in this dunya or in the hereafter. How can you help a brother if he's doing something bad or haram? I think what we have described to you should be a sufficient answer, inshaAllah. Same question about backbone. I hope it's not an indicator of what's going on here. <laughs> May Allah have mercy on us, I mean. Is it halal to donate your organs after you die? What are the kinds of people who go to heaven without being judged? As for the first question, Allahu A'lam. And this is the best answer I can give you. Uh, because I'm not an alim, I'm not an imam, I'm not a shaykh, I'm not anything. If at best, we are students of knowledge. At best, inshaAllah, this is what we would wish to be students who wish to learn more about Islam and give da'wah to those who may know a little less than we do. So for such a question about donating organs, تَفْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Go to the people of knowledge and ask them. Uh, I will narrate you a quick story uh, in regards to this about saying, I don't know. There used to be a, an imam, a great alim, very knowledgeable, who for every question had an answer. Whether he knew or did not know every question he had, there was an answer for it. So the students of knowledge, they said, this guy, what's he doing? Everything. He's saying, Rasul said, Allah said, this, such and such. And he's misguiding the people. So the students of knowledge, they came together, and each of them put his first, the first letter of his name and made a word. So Ahmed Alif, Khalid Khaf. And they made the word, which is Khin Fishar. It's, it's, it's a made up word. And they came in front of this aisle, in front of all the people. And they said, Ya Shaykh. He said, Yes. What is the Khil Fishar? He said, What? They said, Khil Fishar. Ah. Nafsun Tayyibur Ra'iha. It is a sweet smelling flower. Yambu Sufi Afraf al Yemen. It's only found in Yemen. You're not going to go to Yemen. It's found in the middle of the desert in Yemen. And then he began by proving it and he came to say, Qala Rasulullah. They told him, Ya Kazdad. How can you speak about Allah and about His Prophet in a way when you have no knowledge? So this is something.